Thanks everybody for attending the workshop. I'm um, thrilled to be here uh, and to teach you module two. Before we get started, just a reminder to the participants and anybody who might be watching this video on YouTube that the content is being released under a Creative Commons share alike license. Okay, so I am going to be giving a lecture on so module two, which is on de novo genome assembly and annotation. Um, and it's for those of you who uh, haven't I haven't been introduced to before, my name is Gary Van Domslar. I'm uh, chief of the bioinformatics section at the National Microbiology Laboratory, which is part of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, we're like the uh, Canada's version of the US CDC, but uh, uh, scrappier and more precocious. Um, and uh, I have about 30 slides for the lecture, hoping to get it through it in about 45 minutes, but um, I do tend to ramble. Um, and uh, so I uh, want to be able, so I want to just dive in right away so I can make my time. So the learning objectives here are to understand the process of assembling a genome de novo and to know the different types of strategies for assembling prokaryotic genes. Um, also to be able to assess the quality of a prokaryotic genome assembly. And then um, after we've done the, the assembly, there's the whole annotation part. So we want to understand the process of annotating prokaryotic genome, how those annotations can assist with quality assessment, and also to become familiar with the tools for assembling and annotating prokaryotic genomes. Uh, that's for the, uh, the lab part, which will come after this lecture. Okay, so... Genome assembly. What can I do here to get rid of this? Genome, so genome assembly is the process of reconstructing a complete DNA sequence of an organism's genome from these fragmented pieces called reads, which are obtained through sequencing. Here, so here's our genome. Um, so, but modern sequencing instruments don't give you an entire genome. They give you these small little fragments um, what generated typically through shotgun sequencing. So they are randomly fragmented and sequenced. They'll overlap. And the whole idea is be able to take these reads and then use the information in those reads to recreate the original genome. There's two main types of assembly, reference assembly and de novo assembly. So reference assembly, um, the reads are uh, uh, assisted with the aid of a, a reference genome, though. So you map those reads against a, well, typically a pre existing, well characterized, and closely related genome sequence. And then you use that to, uh, to reconstruct the original genome. Uh, it's useful for identifying single nucleotide variants and indels, so small changes. Um, but we're not going to look at that. We're going to focus on de novo assembly, which is where the genome sequences are constructed without the aid of a reference genome. So all of the information is contained directly within the reads that have been generated from the sequencer. This is more appropriate to explore novel genomic um, features or genomic variation or where there's no suitable reference assembly to assist in the assembly process. So we're focusing on this arrow down here. Okay, so de novo assembly, um, still the same idea. You want to take these reads and you want to be able to reconstruct the genome. There's a couple of steps that are involved. Not all are represented in the diagram. So pre-processing is missed down here, but that's where you remove all of your low quality reads, remove your adapters, filter out your contaminants. The second is the overlap detection stage where there's a step where you compare all the reads and identify the overlapping regions. Third is to, um, to construct a graph using that overlap information. So those are uh, steps two and three are also not represented in this diagram on the right, but we will look at the, uh, those steps in a little bit more detail in the forthcoming slides. Once you have your graph, you can use that to construct your context. So you can traverse that graph and find the paths that represent the contiguous reads, right? The context. And so that's what we have right here. Um, the center here. These are contigs. Now, uh, you'll notice that not 
all of the genome um, that is present in uh, the original DNA sequence ends up um, resulting in a contig at the end. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of the biggest ones is the problem of internal repeats. And we'll look at the this issue with internal repeats and genome assembly and how they um, can generate contigs instead of one long single um, uh, genome uh, or, or uh, chromosome in some of the upcoming slides. Step five, and uh, oh, well, before I go on though, uh, the, once you have your set of contigs, so this is pretty easy, automated, um, and uh, can usually generate a large proportion of the, uh, of the original genome. Uh, this is where most people stop these days. Wasn't always the case, but these days, uh, this is where you'll stop. And this is called the draft genome. When you, uh, the majority of the genomes that you'll see deposited to um, the public archives, like NCBI or EMBL, are in the draft stage. But on occasion, um, there may be uh, some interest in improving on the draft genome. And so that's where these additional steps come in for its scaffolding is where you can order and orient, orient the contigs into these scaffolds using mate pair information. So the type of sequencing approach where the um, you know that these uh, that the reads that you've generated are, are um, separated from each other by a certain distance. And um, if you place, uh, if you have a read that places in one contig, um, and a second read on the mate pair that places in another contig, then you can assume that those two contigs are connected by a certain distance. And it also allows you to orient the contig either in the, the direct um, strand or the opposite of the strand, the forward direction or the reverse direction. And uh, once you've scaffolded your contigs, you can perform gap closing, which is where you fill in the gaps between the contigs. And this uh, also could be a very labor intensive approach using um, things like uh, chromosome walking, um, a lot of additional targeted sequencing involved, use of alternate sequencing technologies. Uh, but ultimately, when you're done with the gap closing, you'll end up with a finished genome. Uh, that's what we have here. And then finally, there's some quality assessment where you assess the quality and accuracy of the assembled genome to see how well you did. Okay. So um, steps two and three here, the overlap detection and graph construction steps, these are the ones that I want to concentrate on here. There's two main um, approaches for, um, for generating the overlaps and for using the, that overlap information to construct your connectivity graph. The first one and the, was the, and the original, the OG approach is the overlap layout consensus approach. So in this approach, what you do is you take all of your reads and you compare them to each other. So, so it's an all against all comparison to identify which reads contain overlaps. So some, you know, where the three prime end overlaps the uh, one um, read overlaps the five prime end on another. So in this example, I have on the right here at the top, we've got our um, toy genome with um, some internal repeats, which are colored in orange. Um, and the uh, flanking regions have their own individual colors, blue, red, or green. So once you generate all that, the overlaps, then you can use that information to build your graph. So in this example here, um, and you can follow along with the original genome if you want, but you can see this, you know, this re um, read overlaps with this one, so you can make a connection there, and it doesn't overlap with any others. This one overlaps with this one, and et cetera, et cetera, until we get to this one here, um, where you get an overlap, but now you'll, there's actually, there's more than one path in, and we'll kind of see how that happens here. Um, but uh, there's only one path out. So this overlaps with, th with this read over here. So we're kind of working our way through here now. And then this overlaps with this read here, this TGCCA read over here, um, or 
region here. Now we see that there's two paths out, right? One is into this region here with the red um, sequ uh, nucleotide sequences and another one with the green nucleotide sequences here. So this five mer here, who is also represented here as is connected to a G in one instance and it's connected to an A in the other instance. So um, you have two possible paths out, right? And is, so as we work our way left to right, that's this path here. You um, continue to connect these overlaps till you start to get into the second internal repeat. And then again, you get to this. So now we've created a loop here in this path here, right? Um, and uh, the other path here would be uh, when you're sequencing beyond the end of this internal repeat over here. So you start to see some of the green sequences, it's GT and GTCG over here. And so this ends up becoming your overlap um, graph. And, um, and so this creates a problem because there's not enough information contained in this graph for us to be able to resolve the um, the order and the orientation of these colored regions relative to each other when they are interrupted by this internal repeat over here. So we don't know if, so we can, so what the algorithm will do is it will, because it doesn't have any enough information, it'll just stop and it will just say, okay, I see this one, I see this one, I see this here, um, this internal repeat over here, and then I see this one over here. So essentially these three colored ones in the internal repeat over here. And it won't even bother to try to connect them up because it doesn't know how there's, because there's, you have this issue with the two inputs here and the two point um, outputs over here and no additional information to guide you on how to resolve them. So, um, uh, so, but the end result is your set of contexts, right? And, um, and that is the, well, in a nutshell, the overlap layout consensus technique. An overlap layout consensus is effective for long read sequencing data, but it's very computationally intensive. Okay. Second uh, approach is, is De Bruin graphs. And after the introduction of next generation sequencing, especially short read sequencing, you're generating really large amounts of DNA. Um, the overlap layout consensus technique was um, a little bit too computationally intensive. And so there's a lot of uh, innovation on, in the development of assemblers that could that were more compu faster, scalable, and more computationally efficient. And De Bruin graphs are a really good example of how to achieve that. So De Bruin graph represents the sequences as these overlapping k-mers, where a k is a chosen integer, think like a fixed integer, and each k-mer becomes a node in the graph. So in my example here on the right, We've got our original genome sequence at the top. We have a read in underneath from that um, that was sampled from the original genome. And now what we're going to do for each read is we're going to decompose it into its kamer. So I'm using a kamer of size 5, k equals 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 nucleotides, and an overlap uh, of 1 like this. So I decompose it into all of these kamers. Now, now I can connect these kamers into the graph by looking at their overlap. So if an, if a, if an edge, that's this here, um, connects two nodes, like this one here and this one here, it's these kamers, by um, uh, an overlap of k minus one, so four nucleotides, then you can make the connection, right? So, and that's what you'll find here. So there's an overlap of this TAGG in between um, this read here and this second read here. And uh, so it's reasonably straightforward in making this graph, this connectivity graph in this toy example, because you can simply connect each read that has an overlap of four base pairs together into one single linear um, graph. And um, so that's the easy part here. The difficult part though, um, and, De, and the, so De Bruin graphs actually don't do any better than the overlap consensus, layout consensus is the issue about how do you deal with these 
internal repeats. I'm only showing you for one read. There's no internal repeats in the one read. But we do have this internal repeat over here. How are we going to tackle that? So when you apply this, the KMER approach over all reads, you get a much bigger graph and the internal repeats can confound the graph and they can found it in the same way. So in this example here, and if you want on your, in your own time, you can go through and verify for yourself that these all have that overlap of four. These are all five pairs with an overlap of four. And, you know, um, and that, so they just differ by one nucleotide from each other. Um, you proceed in a linear way until you get to this Kamer here with this, these five nucleotides here, that's this TGCCA here, and there's two outputs now, right? It's from, um, from this Kamer to this GCCA T Kamer here and to the GCCA G Kamer down here. Um, and, uh, but uh, once you take a path, it's pretty much the same idea. You keep connecting them up together until you get to the end, or and in this case here, you'll see that this read here overlaps with, um, did I get this, did I do this correctly? A, G, G, C, yes, this overlaps with this one over here. So, um, so now we have a loop, just like we had in the overlap layout consensus approach, right? One loop here, and we also have these these two outputs here. So um, same kind of idea. You have to, once you have the graph, then the algorithm will traverse the graph and try to find the longest paths through the graph that connects up all of these k-mers, and then these become our contigs. And when you can't um, resolve the issues because of loops in the graph, then you will not even bother. Essentially, it's telling you the same thing. You don't have enough information to be able to resolve the um, the k-mers into one long contig. So instead, you'll just make the contigs that you can, and you end up with the same result over here. So De Bruyne graphs are very fast, and it's an, and in general, if you see. Uh, an algorithm, a bioinformatics uh, sequence analysis algorithm that uses KMERS. The whole idea is is to is because it is very fast. It uses exact matching approaches, um, which are very computationally fast and efficient, very memory efficient, um, and that's the the whole reason behind the use of these types of of, of KMER based algorithms, of which De Bruyne is one. And so De Bruyne graphs are favored for short read sequencing days, where you have really a lot of data to work with and uh, and uh, not as much computational muscle to be able to work with it. Okay, so now that we have reviewed our um, methods of generating contigs, I remember we could continue to, um, to order and orient those with scaffolding, uh, with scaffolds uh, and do some gap finishing, but nobody really does that anymore. Um, we can just move on to the quality assessment part. And so this is very important because not all assemblies are good assemblies. Um, so we need some metrics that will uh, allow us to, to get a sense of whether we have a good assembly or not. And so there's three uh, aspects to quality assessment for genome assemblies. Uh, there's, there's contiguity, there's completeness, and there is, uh, well, accuracy or correctness. So we'll look at the contiguity first. So contiguity is the extent to which the genome is represented in these long contiguous sequences. Obviously, the well, uh, the idea be, being that the longer the contigs are, the better the assembly. Now that may not always be the case, but it's a good rule of thumb. And so there's a couple of metrics that we can use. Uh, oops, this should be N50, by the way, not N5, so that's a typo. So there's metrics such as the N50 and the L50, which help give us some insight into the length and the uh, distribution of our contigs. So N50 is the contig length at which half the total assembly sizes containing contigs or scaffolds of equal or greater length. And the, so the way that you calculate it is to take your contigs and order them by size. And that's what we have here. And uh, so the original contig say is a size of 100. We take our um, contigs and we 
order them by size and just and in this toy example they also add up to 100 and you can verify that for yourself and then what you do is you will look for the contig um, that uh, in which the ordered contig that that contains half of the ordered contents right so where the total assembly size is contained in contigs of equal or greater length right so in this case it's this is 50 percent of the original length and uh, so the contigs that contain um the large contigs that contain that are these three here so the 25 15 and 10 this is the third contig um Oops. Oh, yeah. Um, but the length of this contig is, well, let's say 10 units, right? So our N50 here is going to be 10. L50 is just the number of contigs that are required to reach that point. So we just count from largest to smallest until we find the contig that gives us half the total length of the original genome. So 25 or, or of the original of the of the total assembly. So that's you know 25, 15, 50. Uh, 25, that's 40, that's 50, that's this one here. So that's contig three, right? So our L50 is three. These are two widely um, applied measures of contiguity for genome assembly. Completeness is a second aspect for quality assessment of a genome. So this is measuring how much of the genome is actually represented in the assembly. Uh, a little bit harder if you uh, don't have any additional information like the size of the original genome to work with. Uh, that's uh, uh, like a priori. You don't a priori, you may not a priori know what the size of the genome is supposed to be. So you have to come up with an expected genome size. And so if you do have a genome that's closely related, you can use that for the expected genome size. Um, and uh, essentially what you're doing is you're looking at the proportion of the genome represented by the assembly. So in this case here, I have nine, this adds up to 90. My expected genome size is 100. And so the uh, the completeness here would be, well, 0.9, right? 90 over 100 is 0.9. The second approach is to use core genes. Uh, and uh, so if you know which core genes are expected in your genome, you can look for them. And if you and you may have, if you, if they match exactly, then that tells you a well, you've got a good chance of having assembled the core genome. Um, and if you have more core genes, that's a, a sign that you may have contamination in your genome. Um, and we've seen this um, actually in practice before, um, where a researcher you know, thinks that they've identified like a novel species of Enterococcus fecalis because it's, you know, it's got all these novelty and novel size and stuff. But when you take a look at the core genes, you see it's got like two of every core gene to uh, exactly the same one. And so it turned, that's a, it's very likely that you actually have two genomes instead of one, which could have arisen by contamination. And in that case, it was uh, contamination of Enterococcus fecalis with Enterococcus hearing. Um, yep. Uh, and then the final one is reads mapping to the assembled contigs. And so that's, um, oh, sorry. I, um, I uh, kind of advanced a bit ahead of the slide here. In, in, the, in this example here for, um, for completeness, oh, I messed up my slide, so this should still be completeness. These um, here, what we do is we, we expect to have four genes, but we only see three in our contigs, and so this gives us an idea that we may have uh, maybe missing some parts of our assembly. Yeah. And then the final one is this is the completeness of the accuracy part here. And so this assesses how closely the assembled sequences match the true genome sequence. And you can do this by mapping the reads back to the assembly and looking for consistency, checking for mismatches, indels, or other types of errors here. So this is our uh, a contig. These are the reads that are mapped back to the contig. And then you look for areas of disagreement and uh, you can uh, compile those. And that gives you a sense of just how um, accurate your contigs are given the um, 
the reads that were used to assemble them. And so contigs can suffer if there's a lot of base calling errors and long reads, for example, have this problem where the base calling errors are low. And so it may have difficulty in trying to figure out whether you have uh, an A or a T at this region, in, in this region here. Um, so this doesn't, quality, the quality assessment doesn't fix it, but it will identify these areas of mismatch and, um, and then uh, compile them. And then, and then that number of mismatches in Dells, et cetera, is, uh, is, is like a metric that you can use to assess that. The, the correctness or the accuracy of your assemble of your assembled genome. There. Okay. Here's a couple of uh, quality assessment programs. So QAS is very, very popular. And this is one that will give you your N50 and your L50 you can do identify the misassemblies and indels and gene completeness. Um Busco is a more recent, well, within the last five or six years. This is the one that looks at the looks for a set of highly conserved single copy orthologs and so we uh learned a little bit about orthologs these are the uh these are genes that have a common um ancestor and they exist in a single copy so you can either provide that for busco or it can use its database so as long as it knows which organism it's working with then it can look for these for the presence of these single copy orthologs and see whether it's you know getting if they're single copy, you should only see one copy. If you see more than one copy, then that's a sign of contamination. If you don't see, you see less than one copy, then that's a sign that you may um, have uh, incomplete assembly. And then CheckM. CheckM is uh, does similar work, and it's also um, it's popular for the for for microbial genome assemblies, and uh, essentially does the con completeness, contamination, and other quality checks. There. Okay, so we're just going to finish up uh, with a little bit on hybrid assembly. I think we'll also introduce this one for us. Um, just going to be talking about it, and it's an important concept. Um, well, we'll be looking at it in the module, but uh, but it's important for you guys to know. So, um, so we know that short reads are are more accurate than long reads, but they have this problem where they can generate larger number of contigs because they don't have enough length to span the internal repeat, and that ends up generating these loops in our graphs, which we can't resolve, so we don't. Um, and so that's the big problem with the short reads. Long reads are um, can span those repetitive regions and resolve complex genomic structures, but they have higher error rates. So if you use them together, they can complement each other to get reduce, or longer contigs, reduced number of internal repeats um, that are uh, uh, disrupting the, the genome into these contigs and um and the uh the the short reads can correct the base calling errors and the long reads and that's used to to polish the assembly so here's our long reads we do the overlap there's a question here about something you know where there's disagreement in some of the base calls so you can take your short reads you supplement the long reads with the short the the assemblies Long read assemblies with the short reads, you use that to resolve the base pairing errors, and then that gives you longer contigs with less error. There. Okay. So we're gonna just about ready to finish up the section on assemblers with a small list of some popular assemblers. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail with them, but uh wanted to just point out a couple. So spades, spades very popular, probably the just about everybody's first choice for de novo assembly can handle a lot, like short reads, paired in, mate pairs, and you can do hybrid assemblies. There's different variants for like viruses and for metagenomes. So it's really, a lot of people really like it. Um, and it's their uh, first choice these days, um, but it is computationally intensive. So there are, you know, if you're, if you're having trouble getting with your, um, with your throughput, then you might want to choose something that's a little faster. So Velvet is a De Bruyne graph based assembly um, uh, assembler. And so it's very efficient for small genomes. Um, and it can also do contact extension and scaffolding. Um, I'll skip Mira. Abyss. Abyss is a also a popular de novo genome assembly tool, though it's really designed for large genomes. But people will also use it for microbial genomes. 
um, Abyss actually developed here in Canada um, at the BC Genome Sciences Center and uh, very, very popular, especially for large genomes. Canu is for is is developed specifically for long reads, such as the PacBio and Oxford. Uh, Unicycler is a, for hybrid assemblies. Um, primarily, it's, it's chosen for hybrid assemblies, so it can support short and long read assemblies, and it can also close the contigs or make circular um, contigs. So, for example, for plasmids or circular contig or, or circular chromosomes, people like unicycler for that reason. Skiza was developed by the um, uh, NCBI. Uh, National Center for Biotechnology Information, specifically because of the uh, high throughput that they use in their pathogen analysis pipeline. So it is extremely fast. It's also a De Bruyne graph uh, based collar uh, or assembler. So it's fast, it's pretty accurate, but um, it's designed specifically for bacterial genomes and short read data. Um, does a good enough job for uh, for the stuff that they need to do over at NCBI, and it also you know it works as a, as a I mean it's a decent it's a decent assembler. All right, so that's genome assembly. Now let's move on to genome annotation. So once we have a an assembly, typically one of the first things that we're going to want to do is to annotate that with all and find out where all the useful stuff is inside and, and what does it do. And so that's what genome annotation is. It's the process of identifying the functional elements within a genome. So functional elements can th be things like regulatory, not just genes, right, but things like regulatory sequences and other genomic features like operons, mobile genetic elements, CRISPR, antimicrobial resistance determinants, etc. Kind of, it's really, it's arbitrary, but if it has, uh, if it's embedded inside the genome, uh, it has a start and a stop, and it does something interesting, then that basically is a genomic feature, and annotation um, applies to all genomic features. And so there's two, but we're going to focus on genes, and that's what most people think about when they're um, doing it, uh, an initial genome annotation is, is doing the gene level annotation. So there's two main steps for gene annotation. One is called the structural annotation or gene prediction. And that's identifying the bounding and the structures of the genes and the other features. And then, so where does it reside in the genome? Where does it start? Where does it end? Um, and how is it structured? And then the and then once you have it, then you want to know, okay, here is where it is, here's where it is, but you know, what does it do? That's the functional annotation part, attaching like the descriptive information to the genes and other features in the genome. So start with your contigs. And to, the first thing you're going to want to do is your structural annotation, and that's for both of your protein and coding genes, and which are your you know your coding sequences, and then for your non-protein and coding genes like your ribosomal RNA and your um, tRNA. So, um, yep, and then once you have both your protein coding genes and your non-protein coding genes annotated, then that is typically a annotated gene. Yeah, that's our little flow chart. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, before we start, it's important to just review a little bit about the structure of a prokaryotic genome and how the genes are organized. So, so we know that the DNA is double-stranded and genes can occur in both the forward and the reverse strand, um, which are formally referred to as the direct or opposite strand, but um, I'll probably use them interchangeably, forward or direct and reverse or opposite. So these are our forward strand. Here's our um, reverse strand down here. And our features are um, can reside, or genes can reside on both strands. The genes are densely packed, typically um, about... Um, uh, the uh, the end of one gene is uh, very very close. Like you typically within a couple of base pairs of the start of another gene, they can even overlap. In fact, it's often the case that they can overlap in the same direction or and in the opposite direction. So in the opposite direction, I mean, it's not it's not even not much of a big deal. But there's so much compactness and efficiency in genomes uh, in prokaryotic genomes that sometimes the end of one gene on the same strand will overlap with the start of another one. It's a, it's a lot of um, economy 
that's used to be able to um, to generate that level of, of density. And the space between the genes is called the intergenic region. Most of the upper care of the content of a prokaryotic genome is the genes. So about maybe 75 to 85 percent of a genome um, will contain the genes. The rest is called the intergenic region. So we're talking 15 to 25 percent, typically lower on the 15 percent than on the 25 percent. Another thing that's important to note is that prokaryotic genes are contiguous. So they have a start and they can, they go continuously, contiguously until they get to the end, right? They are not, uh, this is a contrast to things like eukaryotic genomes, which have, are interrupted by introns, so your exons and your introns. And um, so they're not just together in one contiguous stretch. Um, prokaryotic genomes don't exhibit that kind of structure. They're um, almost always just, they have one a start and they proceed contiguously until they get to the end. All right. And uh, like we mentioned, the genes can be coding, like they code proteins, they can be non-coding, and those are the RNA um, elements. All right. So now, now we know the genome is organized. How, is the, how are the genes themselves organized? And I don't want to go into this into too much detail. So I've got labeled as simple structure of a prokaryotic genome, but the diagram to you might look anything but simple. Um, I'll try to keep it simple though. And then remember, this is all review from our undergraduate biochemistry days. Essentially though, a gene, prokaryotic gene has, um, uh, has three parts to it. It has a promoter region that's contained in this, what's called the five prime untranslated region, this promoter region here. You have a transcribed region, and that's the part that has the coding sequence. And then you have a terminal region that's contained in the three prime untranslate, um, untranslated region that's over here. So, uh, and the second thing to remember is that genes are expressed as proteins through a process of transcription first and into messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA is translated into the, um, into the protein sequence. And so a prokaryotic gene has to contain all of the um, elements that are required for to transcribe and translate that gene. And so the promoter region contains these regulatory sequences that typically ex um, exist about, well, say one to 500 nucleotides from the start site or from the shine delgarno site, but, um, but it's typically closer to one. Um, and uh, so these are upstream regulatory sequences and the job of these, um, of these sequences, so you have what's called a minus 10 box, a minus 10 site or primno box and a minus 35 site. Um, and that's because they exist one, two, or 10 and 35, typically 10, about 10 base pairs upstream and 35 base pairs upstream, respectively, of the transcription initiation site. And the, so the job of these um, promoter regions is to position the transcriptional machinery at the correct um, position along the genome to so that when it starts transcribing, it's going to transcribe at the right place, the transcription initiation site. So it's essentially for loading the um, the well the RNA or yeah the the polym yeah the polymerase um, the R the RNA polymerase at the transcription initiation site. Okay, then it is transcribed and so it transcribes through the coding sequence and into the terminator sequence. And here you have, well, two different types of terminators. There's one called row-independent, and one's called row-dependent. I'm not going to get into the details of them, but basically their job is to um, arrest the transcription at a certain spot beyond the end of the coding sequence. Um, and then the, so the, the polymerase falls off, and then that is your transcript there. So the transcript contains this five prime untranslated region, the three prime untranslated region, um, tree prime untranslated region and the um, translated region here, which is the coding sequence. Here is that's and so this is more important for us to know is these areas here. So a um, so the 
coding sequence itself is preceded typically by what's called a ribosome bindal site, ribosomal binding site, RBS, also called the shine dalgarno sequence, and it's got this motif here, and that positions the translational machinery, the ribosome, at the correct position to initiate the translation of the mRNA into a protein at the so it positions it just upstream of the start site. And then when translation occurs, it proceeds from start to stop um, through the use of these codons, uh, which I think I'll look at in the next slide here. Um, and then uh, and, uh, until it reaches the, uh, the stop codon, and then that is uh, that completes the translation. You have your, um, your expressed protein at that point. Well, maybe it's immature and still needs to go through some post-translational modifications, but essentially that is your... Um, as your expressed sequence. There, okay, right. So, right. So I mentioned that um, just in the last slide that the important elements that we're that, that we're interested in, in looking at are the shine dalgarno see for predicting uh, the locations of genes is is the shine dalgarno sequence, the start codon and the stop codon. So, the in the start codon. Um, the region from the start codon to the stop codon is called an open reading frame here, okay? So that's the area that we're really, it's at the business end here, and that's the work that we really are interested in predicting. Um, and that's kind of the most basic characteristic, characteristic of a gene is that it must be, it must reside inside of an open reading frame. The open reading frames begin with the start codon and then they end with the end codon. The start codon itself is typically an ATG, which also codes for methionine. Um, and it, um, it's at the five prime end of the transcript. There are some exceptions. So it doesn't, it's not always ATG in prokaryotic genomes anyway. So for example, GTG and TTG um, are also um, the uh, alternate start codons. They code for different amino acids, though not they don't code for methionine, they code for leucine, lysine. But because of the way translation works, the first um, amino acid um, in a newly translated sequence is always a methionine, regardless of what the start codon is. So it doesn't really matter what it codes for, it's going to get a methionine. So it gets an N-formal methionine there. Okay, anyway, um, but continuing on, so once you once the translation you know, proceeds from the start codon through the stop codon, it proceeds by um, through these codons, which are triplets of nucleotides in frame from uh, the start codon. So in units of three, the um, codons will occur until you get to the stop codon at the end. Um, and an, an ORF can only have a single stop codon right at the three prime end down here. Um, yeah, and but and some ORFs contain coding sequences and some do not. Some are specifically engineered to express a protein. Others are basically just random stretches of of DNA that just happen to have uh, a start codon in frame with a, a downstream stop codon. Right, but don't actually code for anything. And that's one of the big questions is, of all of the open reading frames that you get, which ones are coding and which ones are not? Um, so, uh, and an additional problem is this problem with internal methionines. So we know that ATG codes for a start codon, but it also legitimately codes for methionines, which can occur anywhere inside the um, uh, that open reading frame. So, and when you're looking at an open reading frame, it's, you might see several methionines. You're just not really sure. It can be hard for you to tell which one is the start codon and which one is an internal methionine. So it's kind of two problems to deal with. But the first part is to identify all of the possible orders, right? So these gene prediction programs, what they really need to do is to have as input all the open reading frames. Um, and in order to make sure that the open reading frame that they're looking at contains the start codon, they are detected from stop to stop. So we think, you know, oh, you would start here and you would go here, but but when you actually detect them, you go from stop to stop. And the reason why is because 
you can only have one stop codon per gene that is in frame. So if you go from stop, so you're going in the sort of from right to left here. If you go from right to left, you um, let's take a look at an example here. Let's this one's a pretty simple example here. These are our stops, and here is another in frame stop. Here are uh, here's one ATG, which could be a start codon. Here's another ATG, which could be a methionine, or it could be a start codon, and you just don't know. Uh, here is another one. Probably this is a methionine, but um, in order for us to not truncate prematurely our open reading frame when we're trying to predict whether it's a gene or not, what we'll do is just go from one stop to the other in-frame stop and take all of that in that whole region and use that as input to the gene prediction process. Um, and uh, also we have to uh, go through all the six different reading frames, three in the direct strand, three on the opposite strand, and, it, and do all this stop to stop or detection. So because the, um, the genes could reside in any one of those reading frames um, and on either strand. So you identify stop to stop in each frame. Um, the true coding genes may have little overlap, but many genes have some overlap. So typically they're not going to overlap by, the, by, by much, but they'll overlap by a little bit. So a little bit of information that you can use. Um, but ultimately, what the, the, the way to do the prediction is to distinguish the true coding ores from the non-coding ores and to identify the correct start codon. Now, I'm not going to um, to to profile the popular gene prediction programs. It's just a, well, in order to do that, I would have to give you some background around things like Markov chains and hidden Markov models and that kind of thing. And um, then different programs use different approaches. Some are completely heuristic, like Prodigal. Others do use these machine learners like Glimmer, uh, which is an interpolated Markov model. We don't really have time, and it's probably just bore you to go through the details of them. We'll just say that they do exist, but what they're doing is they're looking at these open reading frames, and they're trying to figure out if it's a true coding sequence or not. The uh, the Because they're, the coding sequence is preceded by a ribosomal binding site, the shine Delgarno site, that's extra information that we can use to assist in trying to figure out whether the um, an ATG is a start site or an internal methionine. You look upstream, a couple of base pairs, like eight to 10 base pairs, and you see if you can you find this AGG, AGG sequence. That's the Scheindel Garno consensus sequence. The problem there, though, is that it's a very weak motif, and that's what this logo shows here. So there's a the height of each letter is proportional to the um, number of times that it's found in a large collection of, of, of uh, prokaryotic genes here. So the ATG, you'll see, is very, very high. Almost all of the uh, prokaryotic genes will have an ATG at the start site, but you'll see there's some GTG and there's some TTG here. These are the ones that I mentioned before, so they do occur, but they're, you know, they're not there. Uh, they don't occur very often, so the ATG is a very strong signal for the start of a start codon, but could be an internal time much weaker for the ribosomal binding site. So you can use ribosomal binding site detecting programs that can say this does look like a ribosomal binding site to me. And then if there's a, you know, if it's upstream by a, right, a certain number of bases, like about six to 10 bases, then you can use that to boost your decision making on whether you have an, um, uh, whether they're the ATG that you're seeing is uh, internal methionine or if it is the start codon. And there's programs like RBS Finder that can help you out with that. Uh, but most of the gene prediction programs already have it incorporated directly inside their, their governs. So, uh, so that's the process of finding out where the location of the protein coding sequences reside. Those are the coding genes. Uh, the second part is to identify the locations of the non-coding genes. So this is our tRNA and our ribosomal RNA. Um, so these are, you know, uh, the important uh, for the viability of the species and also can be used for typing the species um, that you're working with. They do, they, they are distributed along the genome and it's, and it's a typical um, uh, objective of a, of a gene prediction of doing genome annotations to find the location of them and then to, then the, if you find the location of them, 
you're already going to know what they are, so you don't really need to do any kind of like functional annotation, but um, but it's more just about finding where they are. In case of tRNA, um, most people know what a tRNA looks like. It has this clover loop, clo clover leaf type structure um, here, and and uh, so it has an anti it has this anti codon loop that is complementary to um, a specific messenger RNA codon, and on the other end is a uh, an amino acid that is specified by that anti codon loop. That is that um, the so these tRNAs position this amino acid onto the growing peptide chain, which is catalyzed uh, into the uh, into that growing chain through the uh, peptidyl transferase um, catalytic activity of the uh, ribosomal RNA, right? So this positions it in the right place. The ribosomal RNA provides that peptidyl transferase activity and actually transfers it from the tRNA onto the to the growing peptide chain. So the ribosome RNA has two subunits, the large and the small. The large is called the 50S, the small is called the 30S. 50S contains these two ribosome RNA species, the 5S and the 23S. And then the 30S, oh, and, and so the these ribosomal complexes can contain not just the ribosome RNA, but also a bunch of different proteins. I think 50S contains something like 30 additional proteins in a big complex. The 30S contains about 20 proteins and the 16S ribosomal RNA. People who have taken the CBW course on metagenomics will be well familiar with the 16S RNA, which is used as a very common uh, taxonomic marker for bacteria. Uh, but the so, but all of the ribosomal RNA that are contained within the 50S and the 30S, the 16S, the 23S, and the 5S are organized in a co-transcribed operon. So it's one big long stretch of um of sequence in the DNA. Um, the bacterial genomes contain variable copies of the ribosomal RNA operon, but from one to typically about 16, maybe as high as 30, I think have been reported, but um, but typically about about between what you know between one and 16. The whole operon is about 5,000 base pairs long, and because they are duplicated along the genome, they are a major source of internal repeats that can make it very hard to um, uh, to assemble your genomes, right? Those are the, so it turns out that these are part of the problem. But anyway, um, yeah, but, but also just to know that the 16S ribosome RNA is, is what binds the shine delgarno sequence and uses it to position the ribosome at the start of the protein coding sequence. All right, so you can predict tRNA um, using these decision tree algorithms. So that so I mentioned that the, well, what I didn't mention is, uh, is that whereas the secondary structure, this, this clover leaf structure, that exists for tRNA is very highly conserved. The primary sequence, the actual sequence of the nucleotides, much less conserved. So blasting is just not going to work, right? But instead, you can look for these components, like the D arm, the uh, T psi C arm, the T psi C loop, the anticodon arm. Look for these different components, and if you can see these components in the uh, in a stretch of DNA, then that can add adds weight to your um, to your confidence that you are looking at uh, tRNA. So here's a decision tree that's used in a program called tRNA Scan. That, and I'm not going to go through the details of it, but basically it just says look for this signal, and if you do see this signal, add it to this add it to the score. And you continue to add, if you continue to see them, you add up these scores. If the score is high enough, but then you uh, can conclude that you found a tRNA. And that's basically the process. So the TR, whoops, tRNA scan, about 97.5% prediction accuracy. This is, uh, there's a successor to it called tRNA scan SE. I'm not sure what the SE stands for, but I know that this program was made by a guy named Sean Eddy, so I think that's probably just his initials. And it can detect, it has a 99.5% prediction accuracy. So it's so even though you know these are, are very respectable prediction accuracies, this one here is like you know, one mistake every 4,000 genomes approximately. And uh, so this is the you know the, the what is typically used in gene prediction programs to identify the 
tyranny. Ribosomal RNA prediction is a little bit harder because you don't have very clear signals for, even though the ribosome, the operon, um, you can train a machine learner, like a hidden Markov model, to discriminate the operon um, from the, uh, the ribosomal RNA operon from the, from the regular non-operon um, components of the the genome, it turns out that the start and stop signals are much weaker. So even though it's pretty good programs, these machine learners are pretty good at detecting the uh, ribosomal RNA, predicting where they reside there. They, they suffer a little bit more, and that's what these bilayan plots are showing them, the, you know, the distribution of the um, start and stops that are being, um, that are known for the different types of, you know, 5S, 16S, and 23S. Um, and so you can see there is quite a bit of variability, especially in 16S over here. So in, in bacteria, so these are, um, so uh, even though it can find it, it's a little bit weaker in trying to find the, the starts and stops, as opposed to things like, you know, the start and stop for a protein coding sequence, which is almost exact. Anyway, so these, but these programs like R, R namer is a good example and a commonly used program that uses hidden Markov models to detect the ribosome RNA and predict the starts and stops. There. Okay, so that's the structural annotation and gene prediction part. Let's move on. This is, uh, I think we're getting close to done. Um, another 10 or 15 minutes here, which is so to finish up on the functional annotation. Will alluded to this already. So the functional annotation is to try to figure out what they do. So the structural annotation, a gene prediction, that is to find out where are they, right? But what you once you know where they are, next thing you want to know is what do they do? And that's what the functional annotation is for. And is, uh, you know, it's a pretty obvious for ribosome RNA, for tRNA. We really want to know is for protein coding sequences. So this is this process called functional annotation. Simplest way is to do it by sequence similarity. And uh, so BLAST analysis. And if the, so if you have a database of genes and you have your um, candidate gene that's been predicted from your newly sequenced assembly or your, from your newly assembled genome, then um, a simple blast similarity can show you if it's, if, it, if they're, if they are indeed similar, if the similarity is high enough, then you can essentially steal the annotation from that reference um, gene in your database and use that and attach it to your candidate gene, that's called transitive annotation, okay? If there's no highly related um, or well-annotated reference gene, then you have to use a bit more caution, but there are additional things that you can do um, to provide partial um, functional assignment. We're not really going to get into that. We're really just going to focus on the transitive annotation. Uh, there's just not enough time to cover all these like sort of these edge case approaches, but there are, um, they do exist. And, and actually the bulk of what a, a, a modern genome annotation program will do is to compile like these, you know, 30 or 40 of these, these different um, programs to be able to handle these edge cases and at least try to provide a partial annotation. Uh, yeah, and that's what these automated genome annotations are there, right? They generate the observations using a big suite of programs. Uh, BLAST is the big one, but the, these other programs as well. And they uh, use heuristics typically uh, to be to have enough confidence to assign that functional annotation to a uh, candidate gene. And then for the highest accuracy, uh, accuracy, the automated genome annotation approach should be followed by manual creation, but of course, nobody does that. We did that about, about 15 years ago for, um, for some staphylococcus genomes. I think it took us a year to do the manual creation of a team of about five people. So, so yeah, most people are, they generate draft genomes, they do automated genome annotation, they don't really worry too much about the manual creation. Anyway, so... Uh, how are we doing for time, Mia? So we've just hit time, actually, just but I time? see we only have a couple slides left. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to skip the BLAST part here. So, I mean, both people are familiar with BLAST. If you go to Wikipedia page, it's going to tell you exactly, you know, what's here. You can just read it on your own. But essentially, it's a fast, sensitive 
method for comparing a query sequence against a database of sequences. Um, it has been superseded by other um, aligners that are uh, more computationally efficient. Um, but a lot of genome annotation programs still are pretty old school and they still use BLAST. So, uh, but this is, but the idea basically is, I uh, already mentioned, you get uh, these high similarities between your query sequence and your, and your reference sequence and your database sequences. If they're, if they're high enough, then you basically can say, okay, I'm just going to assume that these have the same function and I'll do a functional annotation by transitive annotation. So beyond the BLAST algorithm, there are the BLAST databases. The BLAST was developed at NCBI. They also have these BLAST databases that you can use uh, to BLAST your sequences against. And these are used for annotation as well. So the one of the most well-known is the NR database. NR stands for non-redundant. So there's a database that is compiled from NCBI for a base for BLAST, uh, for BLAST searching, and it contains the non-identical sequences from GenBank CDS translations. So everybody who supplies a CDS to GenBank, it will um, find its way into the NR database so long as it is uh, there's not an identical copy or something that's 95% or, or or higher similarity. It will incorporate it into that database. Um, but the quality of the annotation that is supplied is really the responsibility of the person who submits it. So I mean, GenBank, NCBI, they do have some automated um, quality control that they provide, but uh, but there's no substitute for for manual curation of your um, of your annotations. So you uh, you really the so the quality of the annotations is typically good, but could be suspect, right? And so so you want to use some caution if you're going to use the NR database. The NT database is just the untranslated version of NR. So um, just a, just a just as an aside, they're basically the same. So they're really the same database. But then there's the RefSeq database. And so this is a um, higher quality, well annotated, non redundant set of uh, reference sequences that include genomic DNA, transcripts, and proteins. And you can, they have like a microbial RefSeq that you can download. It's going to contain your viruses and your bacteria. Though this is, so the, the quality is, is, is much higher. And so if you get a, good hit to RefSeq, then you would prefer to take that annotation versus something that you got from NR or NT. Uh, the Uniprot, oh, which was, I think is still called Sysprot, but it were, or maybe it was formerly called Sysprot, is uh, a very high quality database, very, as uh, well, comprehensive. It's not that comprehensive, it's smaller. Right, but it is a high quality database of protein sequences and their functional information. It's been it's manually an, annotated and it has been expertly reviewed. So every annotation in there is correct. Right, it's not just at the whim of the some submitter. Right, you have to be part of their curation team to submit something to to the to Swiss prod. And so, and this also can, it contains a whole bunch of of kind of boring information, but the important thing is that functional annotation. So, you know, isocitrate dehydrogenase, right? that kind of stuff. So which one do you use? Typical genome annotation programs will have a strategy where they're going to use the best ones first, and then they will supplement it with the, uh, with the maybe less well curated, but, but larger um, databases. So, for example, here's your candidate gene. You do a, a blast against Uniprot. If you get a hit, then you'll apply that annotation. If you don't get a hit, then you'll take try RefSeq. If it has an annotation, um, then you'll apply that transitive annotation. So, if you get a hit and it has an annotation, you will apply. You will do the transitive annotation, apply that functional description. If it doesn't, then you'll just label it. And this typically what you'll see is conserved hypothetical sequences. I mean, it's got a hit, but there's no description. If you don't get a hit to RefSeq, then you can try NR and do kind of like, that's your Hail Mary. And it's going to get all the ones that were missed by Uniprot and RefSeq. Same kind of idea. If it has an annotation, you'll take, you'll take it. If it doesn't, then you will call it a conserved hypothetical sequence. And then finally, if you don't get any hits, and this happens quite a bit, 
um, especially for genomes that have like open pan genomes, like a large uh, mobile elements, lots of plasmids and stuff that uh, may not have been sequenced in the past and are not represented in these databases. So, you know, you'll, so you predicted it to be a gene, but you can't find an annotation for it in any of your databases. And then you're, as a last resort, then you will label it as a hypothetical sequence or possibly just leave it blank. Yeah, and that's it. So that's the process of genome assembly and annotation in a nutshell.